Hi everyone, welcome to part two. Okay, so as we saw in part one, the pawns in a weak structure can be weaknesses themselves, but also the weak squares around those pawns can prove very dangerous weaknesses, especially in positions with double isolated pawns, the squares in front of which are great for a knight, as our next example shows. This position was reached between Luke Van Whaley with the white pieces against Nigel Short with black in an exchange variation of the Queen's Gambit at the Chorus Tournament in 2005. It's a fairly common setup in which black accepts double the F pawns in order to gain the two bishops, but in this instance things went badly for black. The problem wasn't the double pawns themselves, but the weak F5 square here, which would be perfect for a knight, and with nice positional play, Van Whaley was able to achieve that, after which Short's position was decimated. g4 is the move that Van Whaley has just played in this position, and it's got a very forceful idea in mind. Short answered with bishop f8, which is going to reroute this bishop. It's a strong piece because there's no counterpart for white, and this short has seen as a nice diagonal for it. And for Willie continued with knight e2. Now came bishop h6, which is the idea of bishop f8 just to reroute this bishop and target this backward pawn here on e3. Uh, but now comes f4 from Van Whaley threatening a later f5 which would uh, trap the bishop at g6 so this pretty much forces bishop takes d3. And after rook takes d3 White has a nice edge, and Short again rerouted his bishop now to f8. Now came knight g3, rook a5, rook c2, keeping everything solid because rook b5 is coming next with pressure on b2, and the hope of a rook exchange, which is usually a good idea in positions like this, but this specific position is a bad example because it leaves black with a weak back rank, as you'll see. Van Willen next played knight h f5, and he's achieved this powerful knight outpost on f5. If knight takes f5, then just knight takes f5. And the knight at f5 can never be dislodged now, and it's very strongly placed, because it can't be dislodged you know, with pawns, because of the weakness of uh, these doubled pawns here, and they're isolated, you know, so they've got no pawns on either side to dislodge this knight. Play continued with knight c4, threatening again b2. So now b3, a takes b3, rook takes b3, rook takes b3, a takes b3, b3, sorry, knight a5, and now knight h5, threatening knight takes f6 check, winning the exchange. And so black's rook is forced to a passive post, as in the previous example, with the rook e6, in order to defend. And now comes rook a2, which is a strong move that prevents knight takes b3 because of rook a8 uh, which is going to be an absolutely killer move b6 is pretty much forced playing instead knight takes b3 now knight oh sorry rook a8 with a knight h6 check coming next and it's completely winning attack for white it's over three pawns ahead so b6 and now rook a4 simply is a killer move that proved too much for short to handle and here he resigned the threat is b4 followed up with the same rook penetration to the seventh rank or sorry the eighth rank with devastating effect fritz gives white a winning advantage after this move at well over two pawns it's a very nice positional display from van whaley so on to the last example for this first segment which is going to look at the strength of a passed pawn. This position was reached in a game between Predojevic with White and Timofeev at a tournament in Sarajevo in 2005. The impact of the passed pawn is twofold. First of all there's a danger of course that it will queen but secondly it allows for all kinds of tactics involving sacrifices and the like. In such positions, the defending player has to really take care or they'll lose the game in one stroke. White has uh, one move that's much stronger than all the rest in this position, so if you want to try and spot it, then stop the video now. G4 
is the move and this generates good initiative already and despite the material equality white is already ahead by a pawn and a half in terms of position there's only one reasonable square for the white bishop which is d7 and now came another nice move from Timothy. Again, if you want to try and spot it, then stop the video now. King f1 gets an exclamation mark because this subtle king move protects the rook and thus threatens to take the loose bishop here on g5. And this makes things very uncomfortable for black because he can't take on e7 or he loses. And in actual fact, the only saving move is f6. If instead bishop takes e7, now comes the rook takes e7, forking both the bishop on d7 and the f-pawn, which is attacked by the bishop on b3. One line, for example, goes the rook takes e7, d takes e7, bishop e8, rook d8, and white wins. Alternative defenses also fail. For example, if h6, now h4, and black is doomed, which is also the case if bishop f6, now rook f4, and again, white is easily winning. So f6, now bishop d5, threatening to take on b7. So rook a b8, and now the kiddo blow, rook c4, with a rook on the 7th rank, coming next to polish black off. Timofeev tried bishop d2, but incredibly white can now abandon his rook, thanks to the pass pawn, and play the incredibly strong rook c7. After bishop takes e1, the rook takes d7, white's winning, and he's threatening to take uh, the bishop here with his king, uh, whilst at the same time threatening discovered checks and a whole host of nastiness. Timofeev preserved his bishop with bishop b4, but this was a terrible blunder. Much better was bishop c3, where white is still well ahead, but not so much as in the game continuation. As we've seen before, however, it's very hard for players not to go wrong under pressure, and this is the small mistake I mentioned earlier that results in a quick loss for black, where he could have held out and put up a much more of a fight if he played accurately. After bishop b4, white has a completely winning continuation. Again, if you want to try and spot it, then stop the video now. g5 is the simple and very effective attacking move for white. Black is now in very serious danger of being mated and in fact there's only one move that prevents it. Rook takes e7 which Timothy played and then resigned seeing that his position was completely lost. If he played instead for example f takes g5 now comes bishop takes g5 with discovered check from the rook and a forced mate in two. There's only two legal king moves if king f8 then bishop h6 is mate, and if king h8, then bishop f6 is mate. And the only other option for black is rook e7. Now comes rook takes e7 check and mate next move, as before. So after rook takes e7, uh, as I said, Timothy have resigned, but what would come is d takes e7, which is threatening to queen with check, and black can't escape this threat. If king h8, which is the only available king move, now rook d8 check and it's game over. The best defense available is rook e8, but now comes rook d8, where if rook takes e7, then rook g8 is a very nice mate, so black would be forced to give up his rook, after which the mate would not be long coming, so it was a very nice attacking idea from Pradojevic after that small slip from Timofeev. So that's it for the first part of the endgame series. I hope you enjoyed it. Please leave any comments or thoughts. Thanks very much.